May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The world that the Old Testament and New Testament people lived in is very different from ours, oh, well, particularly different from today. It's a dry world, a world of dust, a world of scrub, a world of grass that isn't like the grass you see in lawns or on the sides of the roads here, but grass that goes brown very easily, that doesn't give much nutrition. I'm going to read a poem by a man called Gary Soto that gives a feeling of what it is more like. This, this is about something in America, but it, it's, it's the way it was in the Middle East. The clouds shouldered a path up the mountains east of Ocampo and then descended, scraping their bellies grey on the cracked shingles of slate. They entered the valley and passed the roads that went trackless. The houses blown open, their cellars creaking and lined with the bottles that held their breath for years. They passed the fields where the trees dried thin as hat racks and the glows, the ploughed tooth bit the earth for what endured. But what continued were the winds that plucked the birds spineless. The young who left with a few seeds in each pocket Their bites, their belts tightened on the fifth notch of hunger. Under the sky that deafened from listening for rain. Listening for rain. Well, you had no problem hearing the rain last night, did you? And I think I get the impression we'll have no trouble hearing the rain uh, the rest of the day either. But in the scriptures, when it talks about the rain coming like like it's coming now, it's not seen as a sign of, oh no, and I hope there aren't floods, and that we get stuck here early before the service started. A few people were talking about, well, at least we'd have something to eat if we got flooded in into Bosworth. But when they hear the rain, there's joy. When they hear the rain, there's a willingness to praise God and to say. At last, at last, it's come. And in Isaiah, it, this chapter 35 kind of breaks into praise to God. Things have not been going well for God's people. In, in fact, this was probably written while many were in exile. Things have not been going well. Things have not been going well for them as a people or for them as, in the land. And many have been taken away. And so, in the middle of war and desolation, Isaiah surprises the people and surprises us. He talks about the wilderness and the dry land being glad, their desert rejoicing and blossoming. You know, I hear that word, and I can't help but think of Father Frank at a service that I went to. It must be less than a year ago because I've only been here a year. And he talked about the wilderness as a place where God often comes and speaks to us. And the thing that he said that has stayed with me ever since is that sometimes we're meant to be in the wilderness. Sometimes that's where we meet with God. Though often what we want to do is to leave the wilderness and to go somewhere more lush to go somewhere else, to be somewhere else. But here, as his people are in the wilderness, as his people are wondering what's going on, as they have no hope, God surprises him and says, I'm not going to take you out of it. I'm going to change it by sending water. And he provides. He talks about the glory of Lebanon. Well, Lebanon, unlike now, where it's known for other terrible things like we heard this week. Um, Lebanon was known for its vast forests of trees, for its huge trees, for its ancient trees, the kind of trees that you could build a temple with, and they did. The kind of trees that produced wood that was glorious uh, and decorative. 
It will be the glory of Lebanon shall be given, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. Again, those two were more about fruits and more about crops. He says, I will make the wilderness a place that is lush. And they'll see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. And yes, he is talking about the physical place, but he's also talking about how we see things, how we see where we are and how we're thinking and what we're doing. And that sense that sometimes we just want to get out. And God says, no, I'll come and meet you where you are. We trust a God, we follow a God who can change things. For the truth is, we have no control over the rain, though people have tried over the years. They've tried firing silver salts up into the clouds. They've tried all kinds of things. But all we can do with the weather is predict it. Well, sometimes we can't even do that, can we? But we can watch and we can wonder. But actually, God is a God who has power over even these things. As Jesus himself showed as he stilled the storm over the sea God can change where we are and how we are and what's going on in our lives every time we feel a lack the loneliness and the desolation God can come and meet us there and be with us there well Isaiah talks he talks about salvation in terms of, of creation He talks about dry places being transformed into paradise. We we can't really envisage that because we've never got that dry. Even when we get to the point of host pipe bands, all we have to worry about really is our lawn, isn't it? And how it's going dry, how the garden is suffering. Water still comes from the taps. We still have water to drink water to cook with, water to wash with. But these desert people, these people who lived in this dry place, knew what it meant when rain came and knew what it would mean when God came and met them in their trouble. These people have hearts and minds that are racing, that are gripped with anxiety, that are full of of what's going on around them. As he talks about strengthening the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. What he acknowledges is that it's hard when things are tough. It's hard when we feel like we're in the wilderness. It's hard when we are in the wilderness. It's hard for people in our world today in places where the rains Don't come. They depend on the seasons in a way that that we don't. I mean, is there any day that you could name, any season that you could name in this country, uh, looking ahead and say, it will not rain on that day? You can plan a family wedding or some great celebration of some anniversary or some birthday, and you can plan it in the middle of July or in the middle of August, and if you plan it too far in advance, like more than two or three days, um, You cannot guarantee that it will not rain, can you? It can rain on just about every day. But in places like the Middle East, there are seasons when it won't rain for months and they depend on the rains coming when the rain should come. And they can be anxious. And Isaiah says, strengthen them. Tell them not to fear. God is with you in this. He tells them that things are are going to get better. He says then, he doesn't specify when then is, but he says the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be opened. The lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. They could only dream of the kind of water that is lying around out there. The kind of water that will give my car the only wash it ever gets <laughs> as I drive through a puddle. Uh, they could only dream of that. And he says, God is going to change things. He'll change things for you physically, but he'll change what's going on in your hearts as well. Blind people will be able to see. Deaf people will be able to hear. The lame will walk. And those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Now, of course, he's talking about the future. 
And it has some bearing on the coming of Christ for when asked by John the Baptist's disciples, are you the one we've been expecting? What does Jesus say? Look, the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. As he changes people's lives. But what he's saying is that the things that cannot be changed will be changed. Each one of these things can be changed by modern medical science. We can help the deaf hear. We can help the blind see. We can help the lame walk. But for the people of that day, it was irreversible. If you were blind, you were blind. If you were deaf, you were deaf. If you can't walk, well, that's tough. You just have to sit and beg. And if you're speechless, you'd never speak again. God intervenes in impossible situations, in situations that cannot be changed. And he says that the burning sand shall become a pool. Things can be changed by this God. We can trust him. We can depend on him. And so when we look, first of all, at the state of our world today and the things that are going on, perhaps we're tempted to think no one can do anything. You know, whether you're the president of the United States, whether you're the prime minister of Great Britain, the president of France or of Germany or of Poland or of Ukraine, no one can really make a difference. But God can. God can change things. God can turn things around. We need to be praying about these situations. We need to be praying and asking that God would do his will. That he would change things his way. And trust that he will. And so it is with our own personal situations. The things that go on around us. To trust him to do what is right. And what is good. God says he will change things so much that even the desert will become a pool of water. And then he begins to speak about something that would be very close to their hearts. uh, Particularly the ones that would hear this in exile. He talks about making a way. He says a highway shall be there and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel on it, but it shall be for God's people. And then he says something very strange. He says, and it's not always translated like this in every, in every verse of the, the, the scriptures. No traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. He said, he's saying what he was saying is that, that he will make a way that is so obvious, a way that is so good, a way that is so real, that once we begin to walk on it, It will be very difficult. Even fools will find it difficult to go astray. If we were to sum up the Old Testament and the New Testament in just a few words, the the Old Testament was about rules and regulations. It was about, it was about, if you do this, then I will do that. If you follow me, then you will get this. If you stop following me, then this will happen and famine will come and until you, you come back to me. God dealt with his people as a nation, as a people, And sometimes he had to discipline them and, uh, in a sense, walk away from them. In the New Testament, it's not about rules and regulations. It's about a way. It's about following Christ. It's about following someone. It's about putting our lives into his hands. It's about acknowledging him as Lord and trusting him for our salvation. It's not about what we can do about it. It's not about how well we do The greatest sinners can find themselves on the way. Those who have fallen terribly can find themselves walking in the way. Those who are fools can find themselves walking on the way. Why? Because it's not about the rules and regulations. It's not about all the the sub-clauses and the things that you should do and the things you shouldn't do. It's about putting our trust in the one who came and lived among us, trusting him for salvation, trusting him for forgiveness, trusting him to guide us, to help us up when we stumble and to walk in the way. 
It was hard. The Old Testament covenant was hard. And very often they failed. Very often they broke it. But he says, I'm going to make a new way. And he's talking. Yes, he's talking about them coming back from exile. Coming back to Zion with singing. But he's talking about a new way of doing things. Sometimes when I talk to people who, if you like, don't come to church. I, I hate that phrase really. but Because we don't come to church. This is not a church. It's a building in which the church meets. Uh, and I think it's, it's quite funny actually when I think about Desford. That um, Desford Free Church is on Chapel Lane. And why do we think it's called Chapel Lane? Because it was originally called Desford Baptist Chapel back in the day. But it was changed to church. The church is you. The church is me. The church is a body of God's people. It's not about doing things to please God. It's about meeting together. It's about sharing together. It's about living, living together and loving together. And doing God's work together with each other. But I meet people who, who say, well, no, I couldn't come to church. I'm not good enough. I'm, I don't think I, I remember saying it yet, but I, I feel like smiling and saying, you haven't met the people already who already go there. <laughs> Maybe I should. But I say, no, you're never too bad to meet with God's people. Sometimes you can be too good or think you are. Because actually, church, the meeting of God's people, the gathering of God's people, isn't for those who think they're okay. It's for those who know they're not. It's for those who, need, who know that their, their wilderness needs that water, who know that their lives are not perfect, who know that there's something going on that needs changed and transformed. And they need to hear from God. For those who know they don't know the way. Who haven't found it. And find it in heaven. I can't remember who it was. But um, I remember someone talking about the fact that. Those who are part of God's family. As we tell other people about him. Are simply beggars. Who have found someone who gives them food. And wants to tell others about it too. He is the one who makes the way. He is the one who keeps people safe. He is the one who gives joy as we walk with him. And as we share with each other. As we meet with people that we'd never meet with. I was going to say in real life. But in the rest of life. Can you imagine? People from all walks of life. People from all kinds of um, opinions and persuasions. People who think about life in such different ways. But who come together because of this one thing. That we've put our trust in God. And that we've begun to walk in the way. We've begun to follow him. And we want to give thanks to him. For the blessings that he has showered upon us. How did you wake up this morning when you heard the rain? What did you think? I'm not going to ask you to tell me, but have a think. Were you full of the joys of autumn? Did you think, oh, oh, the rain, isn't that wonderful? I'm guessing that perhaps not. But God's people in that day would have woken up and been on their knees, giving thanks to God that the rains had come. Sometimes, sometimes what God calls us to do and to be as we walk in the way seems about as unusual to us as us waking up this morning, hearing the rain, and going, thank goodness for that. Sometimes God blesses us in ways that we don't notice. Sometimes God blesses us in ways that we don't understand, don't really know what's going on. Sometimes God blesses us and we only see it some way down the road because actually at the time we think, 
What's going on now? What's happening now? What's that all about, God? But as we go through what we think of as perhaps the wilderness, what we think of as trials and tribulations, God walks with us. There is that that famous um, poem that talks about, uh, you know, that uh, seeing two sets of footsteps walking along in the sand and... uh, and then for a while we see only one foot set and then, and then two again. And, and, and the person says to God, did, did you leave me at that point? And, and God says, no, at that point there's only one set of footsteps because at that point I was carrying you. I like the alternative um, suggested again by someone. Uh, it's not something thought of by me, but something I find quite funny and quite telling. That actually, I had a dream and I was walking along and there were two sets of footsteps. And then suddenly there was one set of footsteps and, and what looked like drag marks and scrabbling as, as, as we went along. And then sets of footsteps again. What, what was all that drags marks and, and scrabbling about? And God says, that's when I had to carry you kicking and screaming into doing what I longed for you to do. You know, sometimes... Yeah, we don't see God's blessings. We don't understand them. And sometimes we don't get them because we're not willing to go through what God calls us to do. When I was in my early 20s and training at Theological College, you know, full of everything because I was at Theological, I knew everything. Um, about God and the Bible, I thought, until I went to theological college, and then I realized I knew nothing at all. But anyway, one of the things they do is they send us out to some poor church to preach on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening. And I went to one in Antrim on a Sunday evening, and I was preaching. And uh, I began to preach about, uh, I was preaching about, sometimes life can be difficult, and you can have a hard time, We need to trust God in that. And in the middle of it, um, I shared about the fact that my father had leukemia. And uh, things weren't looking terribly great. As as it turned out, he he lived a few more years. And talked about that. And um, at the end, someone came up to me and said, you know, when you started talking about suffering and how life's hard sometimes... I thought to myself, what does he know about suffering? He's only a young whippersnapper. And I remember her using the word whippersnapper. She said, and then you started talking about your father. And I started to listen. Sometimes the fact that others have strengthened our feeble knees, that others have told us not to fear through difficult times, and we can go on to stand with those who have difficult times too. Sometimes God uses what we have experienced to change the lives of others. As they listen, first of all, perhaps, because they know we understand. Because we, they know that we know what's going on in their lives. So today, as we give thanks to God, and as we trust him to, to give us all that we see around us, and as he sends the lovely rain, let's remember that all that we have and all that we are comes from him. Let's remember that he tells us that in difficult times that we should strengthen others and give hope to others. Let's remember that God will make a way. God will make a way. Amen.